everyone recovered from lunch already, so you're all awake. Uh, yeah, then just dive into it. So, so who of you deployed a model to production? And probably some of you used the text classifier for something. So, so and then um, the normal way of things is like you get a data set, right? You clean it, you build your model, and you look at some metrics. Think about like uh, accuracy is probably something, or I want precision to be high. And then you say like, okay, 90%, nice, put it live, okay? But I, I tell you, this is often not enough, especially not for text, because you have messy data, and it's really easy, really easy to get some partial leakage in your data. So, for example, if you do email classification and you have some people, like we see an example later, some people, like they, they're resending all emails, and you see like, okay, in this class, this happens a lot, in this data class, then you have probably a good accuracy in this class, but you're not learning anything about your problem, but about your data set, and that's probably something you don't want. And also, like, validation sets are often not enough. So can you see it, or is it hard to see? Okay, so, so validation sets are often also not enough, because it's also something about your data you have right now, but your data might change, and especially for text, you want to make sure that the model you have in production knows something inherent of your problem and not only about the specific data you have there. So you probably want to know more about your model and your metrics and your validation scores. So, but it's another thing, yeah. What is a black box model? So for me, a black box is something where like the inner workings of the systems are not clear to you. So they're completely hidden. So for example, like the famous examples right now are deep neural networks, right? So nobody really knows what's going on in your free layer LSTM. Um, but even like a linear model with a bag of words representation can be considered a kind of black box because I know no one who can really make sense directly from 20,000 features contributing to your prediction. So it's also something we probably want to explain a little bit more. So yeah, I give you a short outline of what I'm doing. So I talk about the Lime algorithm, give you a high level overview of how it works, what's the idea behind it, how it applies to the special case of text. So there's a more general idea. You probably find it in the paper and that's really nice to read. Then we go, because this is a coding conference, right? We go to examples, show you how to implement it with scikit-learn in a simple way, like the basic idea. And then we go to Lime with Eli 5. That's really, really a nice thing to visualize and to, to really easy to use. And then, of course, sadly, we have no silver bullet in machine learning and probably everywhere in life. So there's no free lunch also. Like only in PyData is free lunch. So um, it, it fails often. You really have to know what you're doing and how you look at your data and how you look at your model make no mistakes and build false trust in your model. So I show you how to make it fail and how to prevent it sometimes. So let's look at the Lime algorithm. It was introduced by Riberio in uh, 2016. It's a really nice paper, say it again. Look at it, read it. It's also not hard to read. Um, and the main idea is like you want to explain the prediction, like you want to understand the prediction of a single a uh, symbol, exa uh, a certain sample of your arbitrary black box model. Like you look at one sample of your data and try to understand why your model predicted a certain prediction. So what does the abbreviation stand for? So the L is for locally, so you, you don't care. You probably have a highly nonlinear model, but you don't care for all the nonlinearities. You only want to understand your model in the locality, in the neighborhood of your specific sample. Then the I is for inter interpretable. So you, you want an explanation that takes the limitations of the user, like the human, into account, and it should deliver like a, quali a qualitative understanding of your model. Then we have the M for model agnostic. So the whole framework of Lime is completely model agnostic. You can use any model you want. You can explain deep image classifiers or linear 
bag of words models. And then the E is for explanations, yeah, surprise. Um, yeah, so how does it work? So the idea is um, you generate a fake data set from your picked sample you want to explain. And in the text case, you r just randomly sample from your words. Like you have an email and now you r sample randomly at uniform from the words and put them together in the same order. And that, that you do 5,000 times and then you have 5,000 different samples that all are close to your sample you want to explain. Then you get the predictions from your trained black box model on the fake data set. Okay? With these predictions, you now train a so called white box model, like the model you want to use to explain your complicated model. Like you take the X, like the fake data set, training data, and the predictions of your black box model as the labels, as the targets for your white box model. And then, of course, you use the white box model to explain your black box model. And in the end, you, of course, want to know, does my white box model learn something useful about my black box model? So, is, so it can happen that the black box model is highly nonlinear in the neighborhood of your sample, then you probably aren't able to get a good white box model for this sample. Or, and then you see, okay, it's not approximating it well. Well, so this is like a picture from the paper, and it, I, I have it in mind always when I work with it because it's really good visualization. So you have like a highly nonlinear model, like the pink and blue. It's kind of your decision regions, and you have your your fake samples, and you want to explain the prediction with the the strong red cross, and the dashed line is kind of your um, white box model. Okay, so let's go to code and look at some example data. So I picked the 20 news group data. It's, I guess, some, some common blog post data under some new, um, like Reddit, I guess. I don't really know. I wasn't able to find out properly where this data came from. It's kind of legacy. So we get it from scikit-learn. It's pretty easy. Then we, we only take four of the classes, like atheism, Christianity, computer graphics, and math. Um, and we want to do document classification. And then we look at the sample, and we, we will look at this sample more often now, because it's an interesting sample. So it's like from the atheism class, and someone is blaming the Germans, and some other, one, some other guy is blaming, uh, defending the Germans, kind of. So interesting. You probably don't have to read it, but... Um, I will point to the interesting parts later. Um, and then we train a black box classifier. I picked something kind of simple, like we get some LSA features. Um, and then we train an SVM with an RBF kernel. So you would, so basically everyone would agree this is probably highly nonlinear, and you don't really know what's what's the transformation really. And it could be, it could also be an LSDM or something else. In the write-up on my GitHub later, you will also find how to do this with Keras. It's a little bit more hacky. Um, and then we fit it, and we see, like, okay, we get, like, around 90% on the test. That's so it's not so bad, right? Looks okay-ish for four classes. Okay. Um, then we try to explain the prediction for this sample we picked. So this is the sample again, and now I'll show you how... A perturbed sample, like a fake sample, looks like. For example, looks like this, right? Or I can run the code again. It's a small function that basically does sampling randomly at uniform, a random number of words. So looks like this, like this, like this, or like this. So, yeah. And then we set up an explainer model. So this is the simplified version. So the real Lime algorithm implemented in Eli 5 does something smarter. It's smarter in the sampling and smarter in um, the explainer model. But here I take, like, you take a count vectorizer, like you basically have an interpretable representation. That is all your words. And then you select 
the k, like the 10 in this case, best features by a univariant test to make it understandable and limit the complexity of your explanation. This is like the, the real Lyme algorithm from the paper does this by something called k lasso. So they do like a, a non-univariant feature selection there, but it's not supported in scikit-learn, so don't show it to you. And then we do a logistic regression as an interpretable model, and we weight this later in the fitting process by the, by the um, closeness of our samples to the sample we want to explain. Yeah, and then we get a lot of, lot of perturbed examples, like 5,000 here, and, and um, get the predictions from our black box model. So, and then we fit the explainer model on the perturbed samples and the predictions from the black box model with the weights I computed behind the scenes. It's not so, not so interesting. Um, then we check uh, how well do we approximate it. And it looks okay-ish, like we, uh, we generate a new, new um, test data set with a, t a thousand samples and checked how, how well is our, our classifier doing there. It looks okay, like 90%. And then we do like extract the features and the words from our explainer model. Here we get the vocabulary from the count vectorizer and then the important, the 10 important words from our feature selection. And then we look at the explanation, like we go through it and visualize or like plot the, no, not plot, write the weights of the logistic regression to the words. And we see like, okay, it has, the white box model has 100% atheism, which is right. And for everything else, it says basically, okay, zero, 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 of course. And we see here the weights for some words. So for example, SGI has a pretty high weight or article or CC. And this is also already a little bit suspicious. So if we look at um, the sample again, we see like SGI is obviously a domain of someone. So an article is something that means like it was um, an answer to something often, obviously. And yeah, also life say is obviously a strong, strong here. No, not so strong in this case, but a little bit stronger. At least it's in the 10 important features, important words. So probably this is something we don't want. So obviously the model, like the black box model learned, okay, some domains are, um, talk about atheism more often. So I take, just look at these domains. And I mean, it might work for you, but also might not work for you because probably you want to use it for something else. You really want to understand what is an atheist the blog post or whatever. So we found some leakage in our data set. Yay. Um, but that's, you don't want to do it with scikit-learn because it's a little bit tedious, not so tedious, but also not the smartest way to do it. So Eli5 is really nice. It's a Python library, of course. You can get it on GitHub and on pip, I guess. It provides insights to a lot of different models. Also, you can use it for XGBoost or CRF suite if you want to use conditional random fields. It provides interesting um, model insights. And it's also really extensible. It has multiple levels of abstraction. You can get a really low level implementation of Lime and, or a really high level implementation of Lime, for example, for text that we're going to use now. And then provides nice visualizations. You can use multiple different explainer models like decision trees or whatever you think you can understand. Um, and then, yeah, it has better sampling strategies than just sampling uniform at random, even though uniform at random is, uniform at random is what they pro, um, suggested in the paper, but you can do smarter things. And that's how it looks like for the sample we saw above. So we have a text explainer from, from the Eli5 Lime um, module and just set it up, fit it with the sample, and you have to provide some method that predicts a class probability or class probabilities. In this case, the predict proba method from our text classifier black box model. And then you use the show predictions method and you get this nice visualization in your Jupyter notebook. Um, 
So it has a high probability for atheism, and it really points like things, a lot of like the email addresses, John Life says, obviously, a really strong atheist. And then like, yeah, Edu, so probably educated people, whatever. Um, and for other things, yeah. You can, so it uses, you see it uses more features, like more different words and a different weighting. I guess it uses also big uh, bigrams instead of unigrams. So, and now we see how it, how it will fail. I told you, sadly, sadly it cannot do anything and it does not solve all your problems. So you have to be careful what interpretable representation you use and what your model is using to make predictions. Like if you have a character-based model, then obviously it's super hard to explain it through um, the words, like the interpretable rep uh, representation of the count vectors in this case. Or if you have some features that are not directly related to your tokens, for example, your document length. Then, so this is the example I'm going to show you. So you have, we make a, up a simple uh, function that predicts, um, I'll always confuse it, like predicts computer graphics, I guess, when it's odd, the length of the document, and in the other case, it predicts atheism, but we will see. Always confuse it. And then, yeah, look, we look, this is like odd, our text, so it should predict computer graphics. We will see. Um, and computer graphics it is, probably. Um, so we explained it with this method. We put here the, the predict probar length method or function, and we see it is basically doing random. You could, because you are human, you find some patterns and things like, ah, yeah, Germany, mm -hmm, and anti-Semitism, okay? So probably this is a good explanation, or it's not. So you don't see it here, but you can see it in the metrics. So an Eli 5 provides you with two metrics. You can get from the metrics attribute. So one is the score, like this is the accuracy in the neighborhood of your sample you want to explain. It's pretty low here. And then you get a mean a kumbach leibner divergence. Um, and the, air, the lower, the better. So that's the, that's the mean divergence of your class prediction probabilities. And it's pretty high here. So we would probably say, like, oh, this is a little bit suspicious. We probably look somewhere else and try to find out what's going on. Um, luckily, there's the possibility to fix this. If you're suspecting that length of your document is important, so this is like the big if. If you know what what could be your problem, you probably can you can test it and try to fix it. So we can hack the the featureizer of Eli Five, and we put a little scikit-learn ready doc length feature extractor that basically just adds two features and make a feature union with the count vectorizer Eli Five uses by default, and then we overwrite the or set the vectorizer parameter of the text explainer and do the same again. And then we see we get another feature here. The dot length, it's even, is strong predictor for, like a strong expl explainer for um, our prediction. And we see also like the, the metrics are good now, like the score is at one and the divergence is at close to zero, so perfect. But still there's some noise, for whatever reason, I don't know. Um, yes. So, too long didn't listen, so my, my takeaways. Um, so, inspect your models not only by looking at the, metric, uh, the validation metrics, so look at the model, uh, like at some predictions. So the, the Eli 5 paper also provides a method to go global again, like this method is only local, you have to look at certain samples and pick smart, and the paper also shows how to do it. Like they propose the method how to pick smart samples so that you can understand your model and go global again. Then Lime can help you to understand your model and your data set, of course, like in the, the leakage is in the data set, not in the model, right? And Eli 5 makes it really easy to use. And then 
the most important point is when you're using Lime, you should understand like the lenses you're looking through when you use the algorithm. Like what is your representation? What is the assumptions you have on your black box model? Like using characters or using uh, different text-derived features and probably add them to your Lime algorithm. With character-based models, it's really hard to add because, yeah. And then never trust an algorithm blindly. That's may maybe the most important thing to take away from, yeah, this talk. So I guess that's it. Some short things about me. I'm writing a blog at dependsonthedefinition.com where you also will find a um, write-up of this talk later this week, probably, next week. Then my GitHub account where I will upload the slides later. And you can tweet at me at this handle. And that's it. So what, how's the time? Too quickly? Okay, so we have time for some discussions, I guess. Thank you. Whoa, that was really quick, huh? That's okay. Hmm. okay. More time for coffee. <laughs> Questions? Or discussions? Yeah, I was wondering that if your algorithm spits out that it is focusing on, on kind of the wrong things in your text, uh, can you use that to guide your model development to, to not do that? Or is there a, a disciplined approach to doing that? I mean, I mean, depends on what your problem is, right? If your data set, I mean, in this case, uh, let's go somewhere. Well, what is happening? Okay. If we look at example, again here, for example, I would, would suggest probably like having a regex and remove all email addresses and like s things that look like websites and then try it again. Um, of course, you can try, if you, if you see your data set contains some leakage, you try to clean it. And it's a little bit more messy in the text domain than probably in other domains. Yeah, does this answer your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. Any other questions? Okay, well, let's uh, thank uh, Tobias again, uh, Tobias. Thank you.